So I went on the internet and uh, searched around and I found a guy uh, out in Darjeeling that was the owner of the last privately owned estate in India, but who um, had been invited all over the world to speak at conferences and, and, and uh, meetings uh, because of his extraordinary approach to farming teeth. And that approach was that he decided that pesticides and um, clearing all of the land in order to grow the tea was the wrong way to go. So he had 400 hectares of the largest privately owned estate in India. He was farming only 30% of it. He left 70% of it in its raw state. And he was only using natural ingredients to prevent um, viruses or insects or uh, other types of diseases, fungi, uh, growing on his tea plants. And whilst at first he was looked at as a madman, now all of the large multinational corporations that own estates in Darjeeling are seeking his advice. And the reason for that is that after they scraped away all the trees and made all the animals that lived there flee and killed all the insects and took away all the brush, what they were left with was a topsoil that washed away in a matter of four or five monsoons. So sustainability and understanding the environment is very important. And the lessons that have been learned from farming abroad are lessons that we have the advantage of knowing before we start to develop things that we're doing here. Other people have made the mistakes for us. And I thought this about this man when I, when I had read about him. So I sent an email to info at, thinking I'm going to get uh, some sort of secretary or uh, assistant to write me a letter saying thanking me for my interest and giving me some basic information. And instead, I, I got a letter from the actual guy himself uh, saying to me, can you come to India? Um, because I think your passion that you would like to approach this tea with, your story of wanting to tell the history of the movement of peoples from India into the West Indies and combining those stories makes a lot of sense and that there isn't anybody doing it. Now there are lots of companies out there making tea, but my approach at the time was to make a West Indian tea, um, a story of tea, a flavor of tea that nobody else could tell. Um, you cannot purport to be West Indian or to understand the West Indian situation if you haven't been born into it or lived it. And so my thought was, when you thought of chocolate and cocoa shell, when you thought of lemongrass, West Indian lemongrass, by the way, is considered the finest lemongrass in the world. When you think of ginger, that's ginger in the world from Jamaica. When you think of uh, nutmeg from Grenada and mace. Uh, when you think of citrus and the importance of citrus in the history of the Caribbean, including helping those poor European sailors who came over here, <laughs> risking their lives to, to, to recover from scurvy, you understood that there was this resource to, that could be blended with teas that could create perfumed teas that would be incredible and it would tell a story that's uniquely from the West Indies. And so I started out. This guy helped me and uh, you know, he even guided me that, no, you can't have four teas. I wanted to do four teas. You have to have seven. And he explained to me why I had to have seven. And that story now brings me back to Pamela and uh, Caribbean Export. And so at this dinner party when I met her, I, I kind of said to her, you know, developing this teaser, so you know, I'd really like to find out more about Caribbean Export and how I do this. And you know, she was, she said, tease, you know, and chatted with me at this dinner and said, this is amazing, send me some stuff, send me some information and we'll talk about it. And uh, a few weeks later, I think, um, they contacted me and said, look, you know, we're doing something in the Dominican Republic called Design Caribbean. Uh, and perhaps you'd like to consider bringing your teas there and serving them to the uh, people who are coming. Uh, the, the thrust of the show was not necessarily tea. <laughs> it was jewelry and ceramics and fabric and things like that. But the idea of having a hospitality area that could serve something that was unique to the region or that was innovative from the region might be a good one. So here we are with seven teas in the West Indies. Uh, nobody knows us. And uh, we go to Design Brewing. And at Design Caribbean, we, I decided to sort of push the boat out with my, with my experience that you have to follow through on something that you do. If you make a product, you don't just make the product. You have to package the product, you have to present the product, you have to meet the people with the product. So making a product isn't just about whether or not you've made a good soap, or whether or not you've made a good body lotion, or whether or not you've made a good airing. It is a follow through on it all. Um, that adds to the levels of desirability of this product and the belief that people have in your product when they see it. Or something that would be sort of more akin to a gin, where we would take the rum and distill it, make something sophisticated and different. This is how the monks developed, for example, something called sotan from wine. Normally, you have grapes and you pick them and you make a wine. And this again is another example. 
They had a winter, the grapes got wet and frozen, and normally you would just throw away the grapes. But the grapes developed a fungus, and these monks decided they won't throw away the grapes with the fungus, they'll actually ferment them. And in fermenting them, they created one of the great wines of the world, an innovation in the category of wine called Sota. It's a very sweet dessert wine served with foie gras and things like that, but it is an extremely expensive, extremely sophisticated product. And such it was with chai rum, I think, uh, if I could be so bold, because when you look at the category of rum, and when you think that in the West Indies, really, it's synonymous with our region, it's such a huge thing in the region, um, there has been, since Bakunda Bakari, still surprisingly little innovation in rum. Um, Breakpoint allowed me to take this wild idea and present it. And we won. And it was an amazing thing to, to win Breakpoint because it gave credibility to the concept and the product. And I remember at that point, it wasn't just winning Breakpoint that was important, but I had met members of the committee on the panel afterwards, the judges, including a gentleman from uh, the Trade Department of the United Kingdom, and also Ronald Ramjavan from Baron Foods, I don't know if he's care, but specifically Ronald, uh, I spoke to him afterwards and he began to mentor me that evening itself. Um, the story goes on that, that at that time, coincidentally, Trinidad and Tobago had a competition called Idex Innovation, and I entered the Chai Rum, the chai rum into that and won that too. And the grant allowed me uh, the cash to be able to develop the product, which I did with whiskey specialists out of Scotland, rum specialists out of the West Indies, and, um, and also tea specialists out of India. So the next point I want to make is that although we are here, remember that the world is wide and that the opportunity for collaboration doesn't only exist within your country or within your region, it exists internationally. And what you will find is that if you reach out with a good idea, that there are people all over the world willing to collaborate with you if that idea really has the legs to stand up on. We, uh, in working with the whiskey group and with the rum people here, we created this rum within about 18 months. And we tested it, we knew the shelf life was good, and uh, more than that, I remember the phone call where they said to me, uh, Kieran, you've got to come and taste this. Uh, it's not just, I said, well, I know the flavor profile is going to be good. They said, yes, no, 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 it's not that, you have to come and taste it. So I went back and I tasted it, and he looked at me and said, what do you think? And I said, oh my god, this is like velvet. And the, the unexpected um, thing that happened with the development of the product was that the combination of tannin with rum created this velvety smoothness that was just un you know, unequal by any other product in the world. And the story then goes on, because I think what I want to point out is that we have an infrastructure here through Caribbean export in my country, Trinidad and Tobago, through things like Export TT, uh, Ministry of Trade and Planning, um, an infrastructure where there is a can-do, not can't-do culture. When I left Trinidad uh, 30 years ago um, and, and uh, went abroad, uh, it was more of a can't-do than can-do. And what I'm finding when I come here, when I come to these, when I come to colloquium like this, is that the benefit doesn't only in include the idea of listening to the speakers that are here, but it is meeting like-minded people from different islands within the region, all of whom can do. And this is a huge opportunity because that was the last part of the picture and the puzzle for us that became important. I met several people through some of the meetings that we've had here that provided encouragement, support, connections, ideas um, that helped me to drive the brand. And I myself had enormous brand experience and the ability to design and create a brand that I knew would stand up with the LVMHs, the uh, Moet Tennessee's and the René Martins of this world because that is where I set my sights. I did not look at middle to lower end companies. I looked at the top three. 